Amen. All right, so let's look at Revelation, and it's the two witnesses. The two witnesses. Uh, the verse, the key verse that we're going to start with is Revelation chapter 11, verse number 3, where John wrote, and he's writing, quoting something that Jesus is saying to him in this vision. I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So whose witnesses are they? His witnesses, the Lamb's witnesses. I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy. We would say they will preach for 1260 days. That's three and a half years, and they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. And we're going to talk about that, but let's get a little bit of a background. We were journeying through the Revelation, and we get to the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. God starts judging the Christ-rejecting population of planet Earth. It's left here after the rapture. And he begins that by, by a, 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 a vision where John sees in the scene of this vision, John sees the Lamb, who is Jesus, take from the hand of the Father, uh, who is seated on the throne, a scroll that's sealed with seven seals. Every time one of those seals is broken, a new phase of judgment is poured out on planet Earth during that last half of the tribulation period. Then we get down to the seventh seal, and when the seventh seal is open, John sees seven angels standing there ready to blast seven trumpets. Every time one of those angels blasts on his trumpet, then another phase of judgment is poured out on the Christ-rejecting world after the rapture. And so we've gotten down to the, uh, the sixth angel sounding his trumpet, and there are three scenes that transpire when the sixth angel sounded his trumpet. And we've already looked at one of these, the four angels bound at the great river Euphrates were loosed, and we talked about the atrocities that happened there. And then last week, we looked at the second scene that unfolds when the sixth angel sounds his trumpet, and that's this angel with a little scroll in his hand. And we looked at what happened there when that happened last week. That was Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. And today, we're going to examine the third scene that unfolds when the sixth angel sounds his trumpet, and that's the testimony of these two witnesses. And so that's where we are today. So let's get started with this scene three under the blasting of the sixth angel's trumpet. John's focus in this scene shifts to the city of Jerusalem, specifically to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This is what he writes in Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told... Now, the one telling him this is likely the lamb who's speaking to him from the throne. And, and the reason I say that, every time you hear a voice in Revelation that's unidentified, I assume that it's the lamb because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I assume that all the unidentified parts of it are a reference to Jesus, the lamb. And so I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. But exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. Gentiles are non-Jewish people. And they will trample on the holy city for 42 months. Now this is... Uh, Something that we need to understand. We need to, we need to take a, a real look at this, and you need to understand that I believe that the appropriate way to interpret Scripture is that you take it literally unless there is something in the context that says that it's a symbol or that it is an um, analogy or that it is a parable. If it doesn't say that, then I think we're expected to take it literally. If we don't do that, then we can just pick and choose what we want to be, say is literal and what's not literal, and we can just kind of spiritualize everything away that we don't like. And so we just need to take it literally unless it says it's not. So let's talk about the temple of God. The temple of God that John was instructed to measure was evidently a temple that will be built on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem prior to the second half of the tribulation period. You say, well, why would a temple need to be built there? Because the one that was originally built there was destroyed when the Babylonians conquered Israel and carried the, the, the Jews off into Babylonian captivity. Then it was rebuilt under Ezra and Nehemiah when the exiles returned from Babylonian captivity, but it never had the glory of that first temple that was built by King Solomon. And then it fell into disrepair um, through the years, and, and then... Um, 
uh, was refurbished during the days of Jesus by King Herod. But then in 70 AD, the Romans, the Romans conquered the Israelis and totally destroyed that temple. And so on the Temple Mount today, there is a Muslim mosque, but there is not a Jewish temple. Only the foundation terrace of that temple remains there today. It's called the Wailing Wall, and devout Jews who are still crying out for their Messiah to come because they don't believe Jesus was the guy, uh, go to the Wailing Wall and wail out in prayer asking for God to send the Messiah. What a sad, sad situation. But that temple is going to be rebuilt. Uh, three great men of the Bible, Daniel, Jesus, and Paul, all indicated that the temple will be rebuilt. I'm going to show you this just quickly. In Daniel chapter 9, verse number 27, Daniel wrote this. He, referring to the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. That is one set of seven years. In the middle of the seven, in the middle of those seven years, about three and a half years in, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. Evidently, at this point, he has allowed the Jews to begin temple worship again. The temple's rebuilt. They get to go there and offer their sacrifices and offer their offerings at the temple, just like the law of Moses says they're supposed to. But he's going to break his agreement with them, and he's going to command that they stop their temple worship. And it says, and at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. What he's going to do is he's going to move into that temple, drive the Jews out, and set up the offices of his global government there. It is going to become the office building of the Antichrist during his rule of a global empire that we can read about in prophetic scripture that comes to pass at this period of time. So he shuts down the temple for religious purposes and he begins to use it as his own headquarters for his world government. But in order for him to do that, the temple has to be there. It has to be rebuilt. And then Jesus said this, and, uh, this is recorded by Matthew in Matthew 24, verses 15 and 16, and then down in verse number 21. He's giving uh, the disciples of his day uh, some information about his second coming and about the things that are going to transpire in connection with that. And so he says to them, so when you see standing in the holy place, to the Jew, it's the holy place. It's the temple. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through Daniel the prophet, we just read about that, Daniel talked about it, it's an abomination with something that is totally disgusting to God, and, and, and this thing in the temple, when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple and begins to rule the world from the temple, that will be totally disgusting not only to God but also to the Jews, and so they will leave their temple, they'll be driven from their temple, the temple will not be used as it's supposed to be used, so it will be desolate, desolate meaning empty, and so he says that, you're going to see that standing in a holy place. And then he says, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea, these are the Jews living in Judea, which is the territory immediately surrounding the city of Jerusalem, let them flee to the mountains. For then, that is during the final three and a half years of the tribulation period, there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. So you talk about bad times. That's what that's going to be. But again, in order for the Antichrist to take over their temple, set up something in that temple that makes it a place where the Jews no longer go, the temple has to be rebuilt. Now here's another one. Paul wrote this. This is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 4. He, again, that's the Antichrist, will oppose and will exalt himself above everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So the Antichrist not only takes over the temple and uses it for his government's administrative facilities, but he declares that he's got the right to do that because he is God. And he's going to demand that the Christ-rejecting world of the population after the rapture worship him as God. The Jews will refuse to do that. They're driven from their temple, and it becomes the abomination that causes desolation. You get that? That event is when the Antichrist sets himself up in the Jewish temple and declares that he's God. In order for him to be able to do that, there has to be a temple there. So the temple must be rebuilt. 
in both the Old Testament and the New Testament Hebrew culture, culture of the Jews, to measure real estate. Because remember, in this vision, John is, sees this angel, and he's got a measuring rod, and, and John's watching him measure the temple. Not the outer courtyard, but the temple itself, to measure the temple. And, and in their culture, to measure real estate meant that the one who ordered the measuring, the one who ordered, we would call it the survey, owned the property and had uncontested authority over it. In their culture, you didn't measure somebody else's property. You don't do that in our culture today, do you? You don't order a survey on somebody else's land. And so this, this is showing us that, that the, the lamb, the one who ordered the measuring and gets it done, is in fact the one who has uncontested authority over that piece of real estate. So in fact, the lamb evidently ordered John to measure the temple of God. That indicated that he had complete authority over everything that was happening there. Everything. Even letting the Antichrist claim possession of it and drive, drive the Jews from it, just as Jesus predicted when he said, let those who are in Judea flee to, the, flee to the mountains, for then there will be great distress. You see, even if God chooses to let the Antichrist set himself up and defile that temple and do stuff in that temple that it was never intended to be done, Jesus has the authority to let that happen in order to unfold his His drama for the winding up of the age and bringing humanity to the conclusion that he has mapped out all along. Now that's an important lesson for us. Everything Jesus owns, which is everything, including us, we are, if we're Christians, we are bought with a price. And so we're, said, we're told then to glorify God in our body and in our spirits, which are God's. If that's the case, and he owns us, he can choose to use us in any way he chooses. He can choose to let bad things happen to us if that suits his purpose. He can let us go through suffering and torment and all kinds of problems if that is part of his plan for the unfolding of the age. Do you see that? He can do whatever he wants to do with us. And sometimes when Christians get into a bad spot because they don't understand that, sometimes they'll, they'll want to know, where's God in all this? If God is really God, why is he letting this happen to me? You ever been there? I want to show you something now. God has one of two purposes in doing that and letting bad things happen to his people. Number one it could be that he knows that there's a lesson we need to learn and we're not going to learn it any other way. How many of you have ever been through bad stuff and on the other side of it, when you get a little ways away from it, you can look back and say, oh, that changed my life. I learned some stuff I would never have learned any other way if it hadn't been for that. God loves us so much, he's willing to go through that. Oh, let us go through that to make us better. If we respond to it properly, we get better. Here's another thing. It might not have anything to do with us personally. It might have to do with somebody else. It might have to do with God getting all of the ducks in a row so that his will is worked out in the lives of humanity. It could be that. Because God has a plan, and God is going to use us in the unfolding of that plan, either willingly or unwillingly, either through pleasant circumstances or unpleasant circumstances. God's willing to do that. And you say, I just don't believe God would, but part of his plan would be for people to suffer. Read about Calvary. Just read about that. Was that part of God's plan for his son to die on a cross? Was that unpleasant? Was that gruesome? Was that difficult and hard? Absolutely. But it was part of God's plan. So if God was willing to use his son in that way to unfold his plan, which included some suffering and some turmoil and some just really unpleasant circumstances. Why should we think he wouldn't use us that way if it's part of his plan? Do you get that? So we need to understand that that's all, that's all part of who God is. And, and we see that unfolding here as we look at this. And so, with the Jews driven from Jerusalem... Because he said, when you see this abomination of desolation set up in the temple, flee. Flee from Jerusalem. When the Jews flee, who's ready to come in? The Gentile forces under the Antichrist. 
How long do they get to be there? Three and a half years. What did he say? Didn't he say that the Gentiles will trample on the holy city for 42 months? So when the, with the Jews driven from Jerusalem and from the Temple Mount, then the Gentiles at the direction of the Antichrist will be given control of the city of Jerusalem during the final three and a half years of the tribulation period. The Lamb said to John in, in Revelation 11 and verse 2, exclude the outer court. That's the outer court that surrounded this temple area. He said, John, don't measure that. Don't measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles and they will trample on the city for 42 months. That's three and a half years. So according to this verse, the Gentiles, in this case, the Palestinians who are in control of all of the land around the nation of Israel today, the Palestinians who are Gentiles will control Jerusalem for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Isn't that what causes the Mideast conflict today? Jews claim control of the city. It's a, it's a sacred place to them because of the history of their nation and what God has done for that nation in the city of Jerusalem. He gave that temple mount as the place for the temple to be built where his name would be honored. He did all of that. The Jews claim that as a holy place. What about the Muslims? When the Jews were driven out, and those Gentiles, those Muslims came in, then they built a temple there, and they claim that as a holy place for their religion, and that's what the whole Middle East conflict is about. Who's going to control this real estate? Is it going to be the Gentile Muslims, or is it going to be the Israeli Jews? Which is it going to be? And that's what the conflict is all about. And so very smart people hold meetings all the time all over the world, these political leaders, and they try to figure out a way where that they can share that city. That's been going on for decades. That's been going on for a couple of generations now. That the Muslims and the Jews share the city of Jerusalem. It's a divided city, and they're supposed to share the Temple Mount. Has that ever worked? No. There's constant turmoil there. There's suicide bombings, and they're shooting people, and there's all kinds of stuff going on there. They're not going to share it. Both sides claim it is totally their own. You get that? But I want to tell you what's going to happen. At this point, public opinion is going to turn against the Jews. The Antichrist gets in control of a world government. He's going to have enough power to force the Jews out of that city. And the Gentiles, the Muslims, are going to control it for 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years. That will happen. Because that's what John saw in this vision. So we need to be, we need to be understanding that. And we need to be looking for things like the rebuilding of the temple to happen. There's a, there's a society among the Jews today, uh, an affiliation among some conservative Jews today and have been for decades now, um, that want the temple rebuilt. They make plans for it. They use their political influence to try to sway the Israeli government to get it done. They want the temple to be rebuilt, and eventually it will be. So, with the Jews driven from Jerusalem, then there would be no witnesses for Jesus left in the city. You remember back, we studied a few chapters back, after the, the church was raptured, then God marked, identified 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe. Do you remember that? And these Jews were to act as witnesses in the aftermath of the church leaving. Okay, Because God never leaves the world without a witness. Okay, even when after the rapture, I can't find any evidence in scripture of anybody becoming a believer who's alive at the time the rapture comes and left here. I can't find any of those people believing. There's still always a witness here so that nobody can say, oh, I never had a chance. I didn't know. God never leaves the world without a witness. And so the 144,000 Jews will be driven out because all the Jews are driven out of Jerusalem. And so then what does God do? What does God do then? He appoints two witnesses to take on the task of witnessing for him in the city of Jerusalem after the absence of the Jews, and particularly those 144,000. John wrote about it like this in Revelation 11:3. He wrote, I, the Lamb, will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy, they will preach for 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, the last half of the tribulation period, and they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth was garments of grief and mourning. 
They wore sackcloth when somebody died that was very close to them. They wore sackcloth when an enemy army uh, was defeating them. They wore sackcloth any time that a tragedy is occurring. And so what happens here is these 42 witnesses are saying these are tragic times. They're grieving and mourning because even though they witness, nobody believes it. Nobody believes it. And so they... They're grieving and they're mourning because nobody believes their witness. That's in Revelation 11.3. Jesus then identified these two witnesses as producing light. Now I want to stop right here because I, I want to tell you something that I hear this and I, I read this a lot. People always want to know who these two witnesses are. Have you ever heard that? People debate about who these two witnesses are. And the most popular opinion, and we'll see why as we read in a few verses, is that it is Moses and Elijah. Have you ever had that, heard that? These two witnesses, God raises from the dead and brings back Moses and Elijah to be these two witnesses. There's only one problem with that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't identify them. If God doesn't identify them, guess what? We don't need to try to identify them. We need to understand that there are going to be two witnesses. They are going to be a source of light. They are going to be a source of spreading that light. But God doesn't identify them. If God wanted us to know if they really were somebody from the past brought back from the dead or, or some strong personality in the days that this happens, if God wanted us to know that, God would have told us, but he didn't tell us. He just tells us that there will be two witnesses, and then he tells us what they do and what the outcome of that thing is. So let's look at it now. Jesus didn't identify them by name, but he identified them as witnesses that produce and spread light. Now, when we read about light in the New Testament, what is that? That's knowledge about the Word of God, isn't it? That's understanding of who Jesus is. If it's the truth about who Jesus is, it's light. If it's a lie about who Jesus is, it's darkness. If it's a light about what Jesus, I mean, if it's a truth about what Jesus wants from you, it's light. If it's a lie about what Jesus wants from you, it's darkness. So these two are, are, are instruments in the hand of the Lord to produce and to spread light. This is what he said to them. This is in uh, Revelation chapter 11 and verse 4. He, he identifies them right here. If you want it, when somebody asks you, who are they? This is what you need to say because this is what Jesus said. They are the two olive trees. Just tell them that because that's what Jesus said. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. So who are they? Two olive trees and two lampstands. That's what he told us. Okay, now let's talk about that. Olive trees produce olives, which contain olive oil. That was the primary source of fuel for the production of light in the first century Jewish culture. When they had those oil-burning lamps, they burnt olive oil in those, and they produced light. These two witnesses are going to produce light for a very dark world in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And then it says they're the two lampstands. Lampstands were pieces of furniture used to elevate oil-burning lamps so that the light they produced would spread throughout a room. If the lamps were at a low position, the, their light wouldn't spread very far. But when they elevated them on a lampstand, the light spread throughout the room. And so these two witnesses produce and spread the light during the dark times of the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And then it says, and they stand before the Lord of the earth, standing before him. This indicates that the Lamb is keeping a watchful eye on his two witnesses to empower and to protect them. He's watching over them because they're standing right there in his presence. Do you get that? He's going to protect them. He's going to empower them. Let's look at the Lamb protecting them. The Lamb protects his two witnesses so they can finish their testimony. You know how long he protects them? Until their mission is over. Do you know how long he's going to protect you? Until your mission is over. Then he's going to let you die. You say, I can't believe you said that. It's true. You know how long we live? A preset number of days that God has determined for us to finish the mission he gave us to do. When the mission is over and you've lived out that last day, what's going to happen? You are going to die. Oh, some people say, I don't even like to talk about that. 
talk about it. Think about it, because it's going to happen. And then you need to try to make every day count. And so, this is what he writes. John wrote, Revelation 11, 5. If anyone tries to harm them, that's the two witnesses, so they're going to have enemies, right? <laughs> they're producing light, and darkness doesn't like light, does it? Unbelievers don't necessarily like truth, do they? Sometimes when you try to tell an unbeliever the truth, they don't like it, do they? And so, if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how any who wants to harm them must die. So, do these sound like typical human witnesses? Fire coming out of their mouths to kill their enemies? That sounds a little supernatural to me, does it to you? So, that's why I think we ought to be kind of skeptical about trying to identify these two as people. And so he says, if anybody tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. So when you're a witness for Jesus, what can you expect to have? Enemies. Enemies. And he will protect you. You're right, Chris. He will protect you. Until when? Until the mission's over. Then you know what he does? He takes you to heaven. You get that? This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. See, the lamb sentences the enemies of his two witnesses to capital punishment. In this case, death by fire. Lots of people today think capital punishment is a horrible, horrible thing. Didn't the lamb indicate that right here it's going to happen and it's part of God's plan? Yeah. So he protects us. Now I want to give you a little story about this from the New Testament. Remember the Apostle Paul? God appeared to him one night when he had been arrested by the Jews and then turned over to the Romans and they had him in prison in Jerusalem. And God appeared to him one night in a vision and told him, Paul, just kind of be chill. Because he said this, just like you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also testify for me in Rome. And then God started this journey of taking Paul from Jerusalem down to Caesarea, two-year layover. And then from Caesarea on to Rome. And multiple times during that journey to Rome, for all practical purposes, Paul should have died. There was a shipwreck. He should have died. He got bit by a snake once they got to the beach, a venomous, poisonous snake. He should have died. He wasn't even worried about it. He shook it off in the fire. Didn't even swell up. You get that? I mean, multiple times he should have died, and he didn't. You know why? Mission wasn't over yet. Mission wasn't over yet. Yeah, but you say God didn't take very good care of him because when he, when he got to Rome, they cut his head off with a sword, and they did, right? You know why God let him cut his head off with a sword? Mission was over. Mission accomplished. Now come home. Come to heaven with me. He said, but what a horrible way to die. Think about it. One moment he's fine and healthy and good. The next moment he's with Jesus, just that quick. Which would you rather have, that or maybe lung cancer? Maybe some other kind of cancer? Maybe some kind of heart disease? Which would you rather have? See, maybe it was God's mercy cut his head off and immediately when the mission is over he's with Jesus so this is what I want to tell you we don't need to fear as long as we're on mission for Jesus God is going to protect us as long as we're on mission from him he's going to protect us until the mission is accomplished and then we get to go to heaven that is not a bad deal is it protection while you're here and then and then the promise of heaven when the mission is over that's not a bad deal okay now look what happens here is not only does God, not only does God protect the two witnesses, but he empowers the two witnesses. He not only protects you so you can get the job done, but he will empower you to get the job done. He'll provide everything you need. The lamb empowers his two witnesses with supernatural ability so they can finish their testimony. This is what John wrote in verse number 6 of Revelation 11. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. That's supernatural, isn't it? They got the power to control the weather. Sometimes I wish I had the power to control the weather, but then we'd probably be in a real mess. 
but they had the power to control the weather. They can shut up the heavens so that it does not rain during the time that they are prophesying. That's supernatural. That's where some people get the idea that this is Elijah, one of them. Because remember in the Old Testament, what did Elijah do? He prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. And so people try to connect that and say, oh, this is Elijah. No, this guy just has the same kind of supernatural power that God gave Elijah. Doesn't necessarily mean that it is Elijah. And then look, and they have power to turn the waters into blood. Oh, who did that? Moses. That was one of the ten plagues of Egypt. This doesn't say it was Moses. This just says that the same God that empowered Moses with that ability can empower his two witnesses with that ability when he chooses to do so. It's just the same God behind the witnesses. And so they have the power to turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want so they can get their job done. He is empowering them. So this is what that tells me about us. If God calls you to do something, if God gives you the command, to do it and it's his purpose in your life there is no excuse for not getting it done because he's going to protect you and he's going to empower you you won't be able to stand before him in the judgment one day and say oh, i couldn't do it no, no. i don't give all these excuses he's going to say forget it i gave you protection i gave you power you just didn't use it you get that and so we need to understand that we need to quit whining and just start doing what god wants us to do okay now when the lamb's two witnesses when they finish their testimony, they are martyred. You say, see, he didn't take care of them. He took care of them until the mission was completed, when they finish their testimony, and then they die. John wrote about it in verses 7 and 8 of Revelation 11. Now, when they had finished their testimony, so he protected them and he empowered them until when? They finished their testimony. Then the beast that comes up from the abyss, evidently a, a reference to Satan, maybe the Antichrist through whom Satan works, he will attack them and overpower and kill them. You see, they are martyred because of their witness. You say, I can't believe that God would let somebody get killed when they're doing what he wants them to do. Study your Bible. How many people in the scripture have been killed right in the middle of doing what God wants them to do? But it was part of his plan. And so they get martyred, and their bodies, I want you to get this, the fact that they have bodies indicates that they're not angelic creatures, they're not angels, because angels don't have bodies, angels have just spirits, they're ministering spirits. So they have bodies, they're not angels, uh, they are, are likely human beings, at least yeah, human creatures who live in that day and time, but they're endowed with supernatural power. I don't think it's Moses, and I don't think it's Elijah. But they are two evidently humans endued with supernatural power. And look what happens to them. And their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. That's a clear reference to Jerusalem, isn't it? Wasn't Jesus crucified in Jerusalem? Isn't that the city that the Jews, as far as they're concerned, that's the great city. In fact, that city will be the capital city of the world of that day. The Christ-rejecting post-rapture population of earth during the last three and a half years of the tribulation will celebrate the death of these two witnesses. They don't believe the witness. They don't like the witness. The witness causes them torment. Can you remember when you were a non-believer and you heard the truth about Jesus and you didn't want to believe it and it bothered you? You ever been there? It kind of tormented you? That's what's happening here. These people are tormented because of the witness of these two witnesses. John wrote about like this. He wrote this in, uh, in uh, verses 9 and 10. He said, For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation, will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. They don't like these guys, do they? Let their corpses lay in the street for three and a half years. Let everybody see what happens when you oppose the Antichrist. And then look, or for three and a half days. And then look, refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth, he didn't put any restriction on that, did he? Everybody that's left here at that time, the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them 
and will celebrate by sending gifts to each other. They're going to make it like Christmas. Send gifts to each other because these two witnesses have died. That's what it says, because these two prophets had tormented them who live on the earth. How did they torment them? With the truth, with their witness. Their witness for the Lamb was a disturbing source of torment to the non-believers of that day, just as it is a source of disturbing torment to non-believers in our day. People, when, when you witness to them and you present the truth to them, they always respond in one of two ways. If they respond and believe it, they get eternal life. They'll respond sometimes by believing it. Lots of people will do that if we tell them the story. But sometimes you tell people the story and they don't respond, they react. They reject it, and they may react against you. So they're either going to respond positively or they're going to react negatively. But at this time, they all react negatively, and they actually celebrate when these two guys die. 84 hours after their death, that's the three and a half days, 84 hours after their death, the Lamb's two witnesses rise from death and ascend to heaven, grabbing the attention, the attention of the entire world. The spotlight of the world is on those two guys laying there dead in Jerusalem, in the capital city of the world of that day, right there where the Antichrist has set up his world government headquarters. And there they are laying in the street, and they're making an example out of them. They're being live-streamed, and they're being broadcast all over the world. Look what happens when you oppose the Antichrist, and then God raises them from the dead. You think that'll grab the attention of the world of that day? It definitely grabs their attention. And I want us to look at that. It says this, after three and a half days, that's the 84 hours, the breath of life from God entered them, very similar to the breath of life entering Adam when he was created by God. So if God could breathe into Adam's body the breath of life and he would come to life, what can he do to these three, these two? Same thing. And so he breathed the breath of life into them and looked. And they stood on their feet, so the two witnesses rise from death, and terror struck those who saw them. Now the whole world is terrified when they see this happening. Terror struck those who saw them because the lamb they have rejected is alive and well, and they are damned. I think that, that they begin to look at this situation, and they begin to think, wow, it, it, this, this lamb, this God that they've witnessed about, evidently is alive. He evidently is real. He raised them from the dead, and we haven't believed in him, and we have blasphemed him, and we have rejected him, and we have uh, on and on and on, and they are terrified. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, that is saying to the new witnesses, come up here. I love this. Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud. The two witnesses ascend to heaven. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> Same thing that happened to Jesus after his death and resurrection is going to happen to them. He is, they ascend up to heaven. I like this. God has a real sense of humor. While their enemies looked on. I like that. God's saying, watch this, guys. And not only does he raise them from the dead, but they ascend to heaven while the whole world is watching. As this event will probably be televised and live streamed around the world, and the whole world sees them. Their enemies looked on. After the two witnesses finish their testimony, after they're martyred, after they rise from the dead, and after they ascend to heaven, God's judgment on the Christ-rejecting post-rapture population of planet Earth continues. It's not over yet. John wrote this. This is in verse 13. At that very hour, that's the very hour when they ascend to heaven, there was a severe earthquake and a tenth of the city. It's talking about the city of Jerusalem, the city where the two witnesses had been martyred. A tenth of the city collapsed. A severe earthquake in the Middle East that causes one-tenth of the city of Jerusalem to collapse, and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. You get that? Is that judgment of these unbelievers that are left here? 7,000 of them die 
and an earthquake there in the city of Jerusalem. Not a natural earthquake, but I believe a supernatural earthquake. And I, I say that because it is initiated by God at a precise time for a specific judgment on a definite de city. You get that? And he predicts it ahead of time. So it's evidently engineered by God. And then it says, and the survivors were terrified. And look what they do. They gave glory to the God of heaven. Sometimes people uh, look at that and say, oh, they got saved. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. They're, they're giving glory to the God of heaven doesn't necessarily mean they're saved, that they believe in the Lamb and, and, and have a spiritual connection with him. It simply means that their terror, you know, it says they were terrified, and as a result of that, they gave glory to God. That, that their terror of a God whose existence they had previously denied made that God look good. When the world just says, wow, that God is real, that makes him look good. Whether they actually believe that he sent his son into the world to die for them and they actually receive the gift of eternal life or not. You see, unbelievers, even animals, can make God look good. Doesn't mean that you have to be saved. Nebuchadnezzar gave glory to God. Get that? When exactly what God said would happen to Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon happened to him, that made God look good. It had nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar. You get that? When a donkey straightened out a prophet, remember the donkey that spoke to, ne uh, to uh, Balak, or, uh, Balaam, his donkey spoke to him, straightened him out? Did that make God look good? Was the donkey saved? I don't think so. You know, you can just, what I'm saying is God, God can use any kind of circumstances to make himself look good. And that's what happened here. That when it says they, they gave glory to God, um, to give someone glory means to make them look good. And that's what happened. This made God look good. Now, the scene of the two witnesses ends with a declaration that it is designed to be a curse on the post-rapture, Christ-rejecting population of earth during those final days of the tribulation period. This is designed to be a curse. The Lamb said it in verse 14 of Revelation 11. The second woe, that word woe means curse. We've talked about that before. The second woe, the second curse is past. And the third woe, the third curse is coming soon. The first curse was the releasing of the fallen angels from the abyss when the fifth angel sounded his trumpet. We've already read about that one. That was Revelation 9, 1 to 12. The second curse is the testimony of the two witnesses when the sixth angel sounded his trumpet. And we're reading about that today. Uh, we can read about Revelation 9, 13 all the way through eleven fourteen. And the third curse is the sounding of the seventh trumpets, or seventh angel's trumpet. And we'll talk about that one next week. It'll be Revelation 11, 15 to 19. Two curses already passed. One more to come. Now, let's wind this up by saying this. The only way to escape the atrocities of these terrifying curses that are going to be poured out on Christ-rejecting people during the last half of the tribulation period the only hope for that is before that time comes, before the rapture of the church, before the time when God said through Paul to the Thessalonians that God will give them strong delusion. The only way to escape all this is before that time comes, believe in Jesus. Believe the Jesus story and receive his incredible gift of eternal life prior to his return. If you do, you'll be in heaven with Jesus, either as a result of physical death or as a result of the rapture before these things ever get here. You get that? We're all going to face Jesus someday. If we're believers, we get to face Jesus and go to heaven. And so for some of us, that may be through physical death. For others of us, it may be through the rapture. But either way, we're all going to face Jesus as believers. And, and so, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're still going to face him, either through physical death or through the rapture of the unbelievers at the end 
of the thousand years. Either way, you're going to face him. Jesus explained the absolute necessary of believing this Jesus story when he said this. It's in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, that means to believe this Jesus story, shall not perish, not die and go to hell, but have eternal life, forever and ever and ever life.